All right, so this is our last session. And just to give you a little heads up, um, the next conversation is with Kenneth Cole, who is, as you, all of you probably know, a fashion designer and really a hero um, in the mental health community. I've gotten to know Kenneth over the last couple of years. I am one of the advisors uh, of the Mental Health Coalition and uh, have been very honored and proud to work with him and his team. And I thought it would be very inspiring to hear from someone who was a legend, you know, in multiple worlds uh, at the conference. And so I was honored that Kenneth agreed uh, to be in conversation with me to talk about his work specifically in this space of mental health. And uh, as you can imagine, he's a busy guy. So he and I got to spend some time uh, about a week ago uh, having a rich conversation about the work at the Mental Health Coalition. And I'm honored and delighted to go to the videotape with Kenneth Cole. And we'll be about 35 minutes, then we're gonna come back and uh, we're gonna sum up the last two days, uh, myself and the other co-founders of OG Life Lab. So on that note, um, we're gonna show you that conversation. And I hope you enjoy, and I'll be looking forward to debriefing and talking with you in just a little bit. Here we go. All right. So, Kenneth Cole, thank you for joining me for this interview. Thank you, Mark. It's um, always a pleasure. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and so the conference that we're holding is for people in the workplace, people who work in nonprofits, they work in healthcare, they work, you know, on Wall Street. And First, I want to introduce your organization that you founded, which is the Mental Health Coalition. I feel um, I'm a proud member of that group and help to guide and co-think things with you and others. Can you just give us a few seconds or minutes on like what made you a fashion designer start the Mental Health Coalition? So, you know, I'm going to maybe go back a little bit more and, and create context to get here. I think maybe it'll make a little more sense and maybe it'll make our conversation a little more fluid. So I, I've been in business for more years than I, <laughs> than I, uh, I believe. I mean, we're going on a 40th year um, for the company. And, um, and at the very beginning in the mid eighties, I did a campaign to talk about this pandemic that was this dark cloud that was over everyone in our industry and so many other industries that nobody would talk about because of the because of um, the communities and at risk and because of the stigma attached to those communities and it was HIV. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was devastating. We did a campaign then uh, and it changed me. It changed the man, changed the brand. And I, all of a sudden everything felt meaningful and purposeful. And we were talking about something that few would, most hadn't and arguably maybe couldn't or shouldn't. And um, uh, and we talked about, and the campaign was about the fact that nobody was talking about AIDS, and um, and and I and I got Annie Leibovitz and a whole bunch of, of of beautiful models in the industry, iconic individuals and children, two uh, populations that were not stigmatized by um, um, by HIV in those days. And the message was for the future of our children support AIDS research. So we did that. And then, and I, as I said, it changed me in many ways. And then I joined the board of Amphar a little bit after that. And I became its chairman in 2003. And we as a company did all of the branding and marketing for Amphar for years, for 20 years. And, and I think my organization loved it. And it, it gave them a whole different sense of purpose. And we weren't talking just about what people stood in, but we we're talking about what people stood for, not just what was on their body, what was on their mind. And it gave us a greater calling um, at collectively and individually. And I think, and people loved it. So we did that. And then I agreed to assume the role of chairman in 2003 on World AIDS Day. And I was, or 2004 actually. And I was chairman for, um, I think for 14 years. And, and in that period of time, I think we made a profound impact in millions of people's lives. And we had a, a, an important role in a, all, in a lot of, the research and a lot of the uh, advocacy and a lot of the efforts that were being done um, as an organization. And it's something that I reflect back on very positively. So um, I, uh, um, uh, I stepped away and, and then 
you know, I was, we were talking to the people at NAMI because we had a stigma-free commitment in the company. A lot of it was driven by my daughter, Amanda, um, and who was very committed to that. And, um, and in the process, you know, I became, they were trying to convince us that maybe we should consider talking about doing an initiative similar to what we had done with HIV. And the fact that, and I came to realize one in 200 people were living with HIV, one in four arguably were living with mental health conditions. And then I came to believe it was not one, it was four in four, because if it wasn't you, it was somebody you loved, somebody in the family, in the community or in the workplace, but we were all living with it. We we're all struggling with the implications of mental illness or just various mental health conditions. So um, um, we decided to, to take, to kind of go down that road. Um, and, uh, and also by the way, two thirds of those people do it in the shadows because they don't have the vocabulary. They don't have a narrative to, uh, they don't have a mechanism to express themselves, which is where you've been great by the way. And we're so, I'm so proud to be associated with the work you're doing and have done. But, um, and uh, so we say, okay, we'll go down this road. We'll work with you, Nami, but I need to know you guys are on board. And they say we are. And then we say, well, if we, Maybe we need more than just NAMI because this can't just be done in an isolated um, silo. We need the community, as much of the community together up front. And then we systematically reached out to most of the community. We built a very impressive coalition of I mean, 32 of the largest and most diverse organizations in the community, in the country. Um, and all got to basically focusing on changing the narrative, um, creating a new vocabulary um, to talk about mental illness. That's, that's empowering rather than than diminishing. And I asked, I often tell people, I asked five psychiatrists for a definition of depression, like a five different answers. And none of them were empowering. So give people vocabulary, give people the tools to do it. And, and so we set out down this road and the whole community comes together. We all kind of hold hands and we say, let's see where this takes us. And in the process, we, it became clear that coming up with this new narrative wasn't going to be enough. We, well, first it's community building. So we part of bringing in these various different communities, at-risk communities, which we did. Um, so we also were, without realizing it initially, we're, we're also aggregating all these extraordinary resources because everybody was playing a role in the community. And so our platform became that. And then we started working with, with people with Facebook and, and media organizations. And, uh, and then that aggregated platform, they accessed and we decided to work with them as a to substitute for their well-being um, um, option on on Instagram, and so it's a it, it's a great tool. So then, and ultimately now, maybe marrying these resources. But going back to Mark Brackett, which is why I love doing this, is that you know one if we can create a vocabulary that people can define themselves, and I love your um, your uh, uh, visual vocabulary which is often how I refer to it, and the, the spectrum of colors where you can change your filter, you can tell people how you're feeling in every, any moment in time. And um, so, and it's um, uh, uh, called the mood meter, if I'm not mistaken. And then, um, so, uh, and then there was also um, a reality check, which was a, um, another option on Instagram, which allows you to add a narrative to it. So you put a filter, and you express yourself in non-stigmatized in a non-stigmatized way on how you're doing at any moment in time. And you know, as we've often said, it, it was another platform that was created by my daughter, um, Katie, and still um, is her that she's built upon in an impressive way. Is it asks the single most asked question everywhere in the world every day of the week, and the one rarely ever answered, which is how are you really? And um, and give people the space to answer it. In, in, in a non-judgmental, um, comfortable way. So, um, uh, so we've looked to create these various tools that people can hold on to and can you put in a little create a little toolkit that people can use to talk about their well-being. And if you can do that, you're gonna you're gonna have a huge impact, you know, on so many people who just who, who exist in the proverbial shadows who don't know how to express themselves. So right. you've obviously dedicated a lot of your career to this work. Um, this conference is focused, you know, on people at work um, and the role of emotions and well-being and mental health challenges at work. And I'm just curious, you know, now 
that you, you know, have done so much fantastic work in this space. When you reflect back on your career, um, especially in an industry, right? Just to be blunt, a fashion industry, right? There's, 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 there's stuff that goes on there, right? That's not necessarily the best for your health and well-being. What do you think was missing in terms of people's understanding back then? I, I think, well, uh, a lot, but I, and I, every day I think we're becoming, we're learning so much more and COVID has taught us so much more. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I think we are, A, we're, I think we're realizing that we all have mental health and mm-hmm. that mental health isn't, you know, a, 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 an individual crisis um, that anyone alone um, struggles with. Um, but uh, I also have come to realize that, so, so, but I think, A, I think people all want to, in the workplace, want to get involved and they want to somehow engage in, in the community, not just in what they do in the ordinary course. And, and I came to learn that early on. And I, I early on believed that I, I was loved that I had the, the entree and the ability to bring my personal resources and some of my company's resources to the HIV conversation and to play such an extraordinary role. And I, I also shortly thereafter accepted an appointment as UNAIDS ambassador, which I still hold, by the way, um, a goodwill ambassador. So, um, but then I, I was reminded that a group of associates not that many years later came and said, you know, we, we, we love that you do what you do. And it's part of the reasons we came to this company, but we don't love that you don't make it available to us. Mm-hmm. So, and I said, well, you know, I didn't think I had the right to impose it upon you. And I, it wasn't my intention to do that. And um, but they said, well, why don't you make it available and let us choose? So we started to do that. And, um, and it was so, it did so much, I think, for the, for the morale and um, the sense of purpose, of, and not just individually, but collectively. And, and I, I think just as it changed me individually, it changed, and it changed the brand, it changed the company. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I continued to find ways to, you know, to go down these roads um, a, as a group. And uh, as well as what I do individually, and uh, I think it's been great for the business. Um, and uh, I mean, mental health, we're learning today, it has devastated. It's the single largest um, uh, cause lot of, of loss of pr- productivity in the workplace. I think they, the statistic is over a trillion dollars globally, mm-hmm. 200 million work days, 44, $44 billion was lost just in the United States every year because of, of um, anxiety and severe anxiety and depression. Um, and most, uh, almost 40 plus percent of absenteeism is because of, of people's um, uh, anxiety and related and or depression. So um, I think if you can somehow put it out there, make it an open, make it a safe place to talk about it and a safe place to come and allow people to take the time if they need it, um, I, I think people will see such significant increase in their ability to recruit and to retain um, employees. And they'll see so much more productivity um, and, and, and coming out of, um, you know, what, what, what they do in the ordinary course. So uh, I, I think we're seeing that. And I think we'll see that even more. So let's, let's just go, let's talk about you as a leader or leaders in general. Um, any best practices, you know, like it's hard, right? I know I'm, I run a, a group, obviously I'm at a university. I have a team of 60, you know, people think, Mark, you're the director of the center for emotional intelligence. You know, you're supposed to be um, able to deal with your stress and anxiety. And there were a few moments during the pandemic where I was like a mess. <laughs> um, and, and so where does, you know, the vulnerability factor come in? How do you think leaders can express their feelings without being seen as weak. So this is was one of the big takeaways for me personally, like you, I think. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's fascinating for me that you just said that because what we just went through, I, I don't believe there's anybody that wasn't overwhelmed through COVID. Um, mm-hmm. No, none of us understood what isolating, self-isolating, the implications attached to that were. There were these studies done after SARS and a third of those people after much less severe um, quarantining came through with symptoms of depression and a third of symptoms of, of PTSD. I mean, it is so profound. Um, but what we had here is not just 
that and in such a bigger way. And this is on top of all those people already struggling. We had this pervasive uncertainty that was that we were living with. And, and we woke up every day not knowing what tomorrow would was in store. And were we going back to work? Were we going back to school? Um, do I need to wear a mask? Then ultimately, do I need to get a vaccine? Well, if I do, do, then what does that mean? And when can I engage with who? Can I see friends? Can I not see friends? What's going to happen in this political universe, which was really on top of everything else? And, um, and then um, we saw all these other movements that kind of came about in, at the same time. And I was in, really feel I was in a perpetual fog for a year. And had I not, I don't even think I would have acknowledged it, embraced that had I not been on the road I was on. So in many ways, I feel grateful. Um, but I don't know anybody. And to the degree they were, then they're not. No, but how much, it. Kenneth, how much do you disclose of that to your, you know, you run, you, you run a company, you have directors, you've got, you know, all these people working. How much, how much can they know about you, the manager, the leader, um, in terms of the fog? You know, can you talk about the fog? Well, I did it, and I did it on 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 Katie on the How Are You Really initiative, and and I did my first conversation, and I spoke about about my state of mind and how I was struggling, and it was so empowering. I got to tell you, and I had not really ever done that before because I just it's something that typically we don't do culturally. Men more so than women, black men more than white men, Hispanic men, um, Asian. Um, American Asian men, I mean, it is something that we are taught is not a masculine trait. It's not something that is culturally embraced and acceptable and appropriate. But I think we're realizing now that, that, that maybe it is. And certainly it's, it's much, much less than um, of a, of a um, it, it's much more acceptable now than it ever has been up until now. And I think we're gonna become, see it even more so. And what, a lot of what we're trying to do is create tools to show and create role models for people to look at um, and see that it's a, it's safe. It's okay to be, to be vulnerable. Isn't weak necessarily. And and if you can encourage people to be vulnerable, that's an extraordinary um, talent and um, an interpersonal skill set that isn't really taught. And you can be a good listener. And 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 and. and um, you know, we did this what we call one-to-one -one series where people would pick their one and have these vulnerable conversations. We did on Instagram and we, we called it every day in May and we had these conversations and we had a mental health professional and you thankfully were one of them. Um, and so, and they would contextualize those conversations and they were all, you know, we use Oprah's production team and, uh, and Oprah was the last one. And then we had these very, you know, all, you know, all uh, well-networked individuals, all were appropriate role models in their own world and their own little communities. And it put themselves out there each in different ways. Mm -hmm. And um, and the, all those conversations exist right now on our website, on the Mental Health Coalition. You go to our Instagram page or you go to the website and you can see some of those conversations and they're really impressive. And and the more, and you see athletes and, and uh, you saw Doc Rivers, a coach, talking to Michael Michael of um, the uh, um, you know the uh, basketball player, and then you, you have different levels of um, of engagement, and um, uh, and uh, Governor Kasich talking to Lionel Richie, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and so they're just so I, I had a conversation with Whoopi Goldberg. So there are different kinds of conversations with people. And then you had a kind of uh, some professional guidance and support and basically, you know, helping you, you know, um, process some of your thoughts. So in any case, so that was another, but so show people a path and create by example, um, an but opportunity I, for people to put it out there. But ahead, one sorry. thing I'm hearing, no, what I'm hearing though, is that, I think there's a fine line between vulnerability, you know, I mean, you walk into your office, like you're, you're doing a company meeting, you're like, everybody, you know, I'm just letting you know, I'm a mess, I'm in a fog, you know, and everybody's like, oh, shit, I'm going to get another job, right? <laughs> Versus, you know, I'm in a fog, but here's how I'm managing it. And I think there's a, I'm just curious what you think around the idea of, you know, the vulnerability, but not but also showing kind of 
out loud even like your process for dealing with it you know i'm i'm i feel good dealing with it and uh, by the way i'm just realizing like back i i it was kevin love who spoke to doc rivers uh -huh. um I, I love kevin and he's been a great role model and in, in, in amongst so many athletes and because it those guys do not Put themselves out there so um i think that when i did it when i did my first how are you really narrative um and i acknowledged my struggles um it was in some ways it was so um it was so uh empowering and uh and and everything started to just make so much more sense so and I do it in the company all the time, and I I'm I'm finding my voice in that way, and and mm -hmm. and I'm encouraging others to do the same. And if you're struggling, then well, you know, welcome to the club. So, and if you're uh -huh. not, you're not being honest with me. So, so um, <laughs> but we struggle in different ways, and we process it in different ways, and 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 it's okay. So, and you know, find your voice and find the way to you know encourage it and support it, and um, and I think at the end of the day. It, it it will take you and it will accelerate the journey and the and at the end of the day it will um elevate the destination you know so one of the things you know i'm coming I'm, now we're doing those like one-to-ones with you and me and i'm like now i'm going to turn to mark the researcher and say you know one of the things that you're you're um, bringing up is is this research on just the mere expression you know like think about what it's like to be living a certain way, whether it be in a fog, anxious, depressed, you know, trauma from whatever it is, and you're it's like trapped in your body. And how it can affect your physical health, your mental health, your relationships, your decision making. And then just that catharsis that you're really talking about of just here's who I am, and that freedom that comes from just the expression of it. And so in many ways, sometimes the actual strategy is not you know, an actual strategy, it's literally the mere expression, you know, that that that's empowering in and of itself as a strategy. Um, all right, so there's a lot of managers, there's a lot of leaders here thinking like, well, Kenneth Cole can do that because he's a huge, he's famous and, you know, and Mark can do it because that's like, he's a professor of emotional intelligence. If he can't do it, nobody can. <laughs> and so, what are your like little tips for people in terms of so, you know, one, of, one of the things that i've changed i've changed the company's mission vision by the way recently and we used to focus on uh, create tools to help um you help your appearance and help so you introduce yourself you know at any given time to the world um with uh you know with with uh um with clothes accessories that make you look a certain way but i came to i, I remember seeing my angela quote not that long ago which i'm i'm, I'm gonna mess up a little bit but it was something says something to the effect that people will people will not remember what you said or did but they'll always remember how you made them feel yep. and so i changed our vision here our mission our objectives here and it's not it's to essentially um we're going to very much focus on how what we do makes you feel. And we're going to create clothes and accessories that give you a whole emotional connection to yourself and to them and ultimately to yourself. So, um, and I think, and, and I, it, it just feels so much more important and, and, and appropriate, and especially in this moment in time. So one thing you're saying is that, you know, a CEO of a company can really relook their mission and vision statements. And like, does it have any bearing on the social and emotional health, you know, of the people that work there or the world that it serves. I think that's, that's pretty, pretty important. Actually, it's funny because in my work in schools, we ask the principals, like, is emotional intelligence, you know, in the mission, in the vision of your school, because if it's not in your district vision, then it's probably not getting done. But if it's in it, it can. I think we have to look in the we have to look in the mirror on a regular basis, and we have to look at the general context of what what we're looking at, and uh, and what we do is defined by you know where we are and 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 where we are at, at again individually and collectively. So, um, 
and we're all in a different place right now. And, and this uncertainty is pervasive. And we still don't know what, what work is going to look like and to what degree we have to be how present and where. We've learned we can be productive from anywhere in the world at any moment in time. Um, I mean, there's a lot of good that has come from this. But, um, but um, and the ability to, you know, to live with this pervasive uncertainty is, um, you know, is, is a... Uh, I guess it's a skill, but at the end of the day, I think we're better for it. But unfortunately, that's the reality. And uh, but uncertainty is so debilitating, typically. And uh, and there and that goes on. And and uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. And I don't believe the world is ever going to be the way it was. Again, I don't think it's ever going to be the way it is again. And there's going to be this new hybrid that we're all going to figure out independently. And my hybrid may not be like yours. Mm -hmm. And yours may not be like somebody else's, but we're going to figure out how to be productive, you know, for ourselves, the way we define it and the way we want to be. And, um, and, and our physical and, and mental well-being is going to be um, a much, uh, much more paramount, much more importance to us all. You know, you're making me so, a big piece of this because, you know, I think a big problem with hybrid was, you know, will people be working? Can I trust my employees? Can I trust it brings up a lot of trust issues and, you know, trust is a big right. issue in organizations. And I think part of the crisis, the opportunity that came out of it is that like you're saying, actually people were more productive in some instances. Um, and so it could actually increase trust, which is strange because you think of trust having to be like face to face all the time, but maybe not. So I know we only have a couple minutes left and I want to wrap up on a, with a little bit of visioning. So it is, today is, God only knows what day it is. Who knows anymore when you're working in hybrid mode, right? It's October 27th, 2021. Let's say it's October 27th, 2023. It's two years from now. The Mental Health Coalition's, you know, has millions of people are reading your resources and getting support organizations are taking seriously the things that we spoke about today what's different Kenneth? well i i i resist temptation to want to project where we're going to be in, in a few years because i don't know that we have the ability to really figure that out and and i i'm much more in the moment and i'm much more focusing on where we are today and, and where we'll likely and what tomorrow looks like um i'm I'm, I'm very uh, resistant or reluctant to go two years down even. But I do think that we are uh, emotionally stronger and we By the way, you're not, supposed to you're not supposed to disagree with my question, by the way. It's okay. Oh, did I? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will be an even bigger fan of Mark Brackett's in two years from now that, than I am now. Right. And um, I will be even more admirable of the work you're doing and the impact that you're able to make. And the support you're able to bring to you have will have brought to the mental health coalition, which is already pretty significant, and hopefully the lives it will be able to positively impact. And um, so, but I do think we will be emotionally more literate, and we'll be more understanding of ourselves and each other. And it'll be an interesting journey getting there. But I think we're all going to figure it out, and uh, we're going to figure out you know necessity is the mother of invention, as they say, and and um, we're going to learn how to support each other because we need to and how we're going to get each other through this. I don't think masks go away. Mm -hmm. I think there is, you know, there's, we're social, we've learned to socially distant distance, but hopefully we're, we're emotionally, we're, we find a way to stay connected. Um, but, but that's going to take work. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and we're going to look for the positives wherever we can find them. So I'm looking and trying to be relentlessly optimistic, which is I used to be at one point in my career. It's harder now, but that's that's a goal I have. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we're gonna. I, my, I do believe we're gonna together. I do think we can't really make an impact. Um, we can't do this alone. I mean, we have to. Do this. It's going to require that we all. It's going to be an unprecedented collaboration um, and alliance and coalition we're going to need in order to accomplish what we are setting out to do. But I don't, I, there's nobody I know that doesn't want to be part of it in some way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I thank you for your support and leadership in this, in this community. And, uh, 
and I'm honored to work with you and also have this conversation. I don't want to end on me. I have to end on you because you're the. <laughs> So, That's okay. As much as my ego feels <laughs> taken care of right now, um, I just want to thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be a part of the coalition. And also, you know, I wanted to summarize what I heard you say, which is that, you know, if we think about systemic change and everybody works together for the common goal, no matter what the heck is going on in the world around us, right? If we, we're going to be, if we're more literate and have better language to describe our experiences and find ways to, to stay socially connected, like just those two things alone are gonna make the world a better place. I agree. Thank you, Kenneth. I agree, and, uh, and we'll get there. Thank you, Mark, look forward to working with you. Appreciate it. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.